welcome to the Old Time Radio Hour. I'm your host, Justine Ward, and this week we bring you the most popular show from radio's golden age. When George Bernard Shaw visited America in 1933, he said the three things he would never forget about America were the Rocky Mountains, Niagara Falls, and Amos and Andy. In the early days, it was a two-man show with creators Freeman Gosden and Charles Correll doing all the voices. They integrated the cast in 1939 with actress Ernestine Wade playing various characters, including Kingfish's sweetheart Sapphire. Ernestine Wade plays Florence in this episode from 1944 with Ethel Waters guest starring. Laugh along with Amos and Andy with guest star Ethel Waters First broadcast January 28, 1944 on NBC. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the Amos and Andy Show with their guest tonight, Miss Ethel Waters. Our story tonight opens on a train coming down from Albany. Right now, the train has just left Yonkers and is approaching the outskirts of New York City. Two wealthy men in the club car are talking about an experience one of them had two weeks ago on this same train. So Armstrong wanted to bet me that Consolidated Cable wouldn't hit 47 this year. Did you bet him? I'll say I bet him. I bet him $1,000. That's when I pulled out the thousand-dollar bill and was going to hand it to Lawrence so he could hold the stakes. Oh, you really carry big ones, don't you? Oh, well, that's another story. I got it on a real estate deal. <laughs> anyway, we were standing on the observation platform, and I pulled out this thousand-dollar bill, and just as I was going to hand it to Lawrence, a gust of wind came along and blew it right out of my hand. Oh, gee, that's really an awful thing to happen. It happened right around here, huh? No, it was a little further down, somewhere before we pulled into the 125th Street Station. Happened so fast, I couldn't remember the spot. Well, I guarantee that whoever found it needed a lot more than you do. Yeah, I guess you're right there. But I tell you, Willard, I'd love to have seen the face on the person who picked it up. I'd have loved to have followed him further to see what he did with the money. I'll bet somebody's life's changed all of a sudden, huh? You know, I'd give anything to know what happened to that thousand-dollar bill. The last time I saw it, it was fluttering down to the street. And that's the way I feel. You know, Lightning, every time I walk under these railroad tracks here, I kind of get the traveling bug. Ah, uh, yeah, the traveling show is nice, all right. My wife's cousin is a Pullman porter. Yeah, well, the way traveling is today, a uh, Pullman porter is about the only one show of a reservation to go somewhere. Uh, you know a Pullman porter can travel free. Yeah, well, the trouble is, though, you got to make up them beds, and I don't like housework. Uh, <laughs> them Pullman porters really keep going. Yeah, that... Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, what you picking up there, Miss Landon? Look at this, Lightning. A thousand-dollar greenback. Boy, they sure make that stage money look real these days, don't they? <laughs> Yeah, I said, that sure is a good imitation, all right. Look, Miss Anna, they even got them little silk threads in the paper that the money is printed on. Yeah, the... Hey, Lightning, wait a minute. Silk threads. And this has got a number on it, too. Yeah. I'll bet you this is real money. Just like I say, Andy, this friend of mine says that this is a real thousand-dollar bill. Yeah. I tell you, Brother Andy, you're making a big mistake if you put an ad in the newspaper. I is, huh? Oh, Kingfish, what is you talking about? It's the only right thing for Andy to do is to put an ad in the lost and found column and at least try to find the person that lost the money. Then his conscience is clear, and he ain't going to get in no trouble. Yeah, I got to agree with Amos on that. Well, now, wait a minute, you, Andy. He must ain't reserted all the facts. I was thinking of you, partner, dear. Hmm, you is, huh? <laughs> yeah, now suppose, uh, suppose you put an ad in the paper. Cost you about $8. Then the man come claim the money. And then he refuses to pay for the ad. And you was out $8. Yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, I'll even go further than that, Andy. Uh, how long ago 
did the man lose the money? I don't know. Of course you don't know. Maybe he lost it a month ago, maybe two months ago. He might uh, want to charge you interest for the time it's been gone, yeah. <laughs> uh, what about that, Amos? Oh, listen, Andy. Now, wait a minute, Chill. On top of that, this man is liable to claim that when he lost a $1,000 bill, it was in a genuine leather wallet. And he wants you to pay for that, too. That's what he do. Uh, you know he is, without a doubt, the cheapest guy in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Andy, listen. Don't pay no attention to the kingfish. Why don't you take my advice and put an ad in the newspaper? Yeah, Amos, you was right. All right, then, boys. If that's the way you want to act, I'll go along with you and show you how a good sport. That's the spirit, Kingfish. Yeah, I'll even help you with putting the ad in the paper. The truth is, I know just the paper you ought to put the ad in, and I think they'll give you a cheaper rate. What paper is that? Uh, the Weekly Clarion in Butte, Montana. <laughs> Well, Amos, I done had my ad in one of the local papers for four days now, and I never got no answer. Not even no phony ones. Well, at least you try to find out who lost it, Andy, and after all, I can't go around and expect you to go around and ask everybody in New York about the thing, too. I know that. Yeah, I ain't going to ask nobody nothing, believe me. Well, I would say now that the money belongs to you. Oh, sure, now it's legal. Amos, I is a rich man. I knowed I'd make good someday. Yeah, well, now, $1,000 sure is a lot of money. And if I was you, Andy, for once, I would start a bank account and stick that money in the bank. Yeah, and start drawing checks on it, huh? No, no, I mean save it. Oh, yeah, but that's only the principal. I ain't going to have nothing to worry about when the interest starts compounding up on me. That two-off 10 net 60 with a semi-annual in there and everything. <laughs> Well, it's your money, Andy. Yeah, I'm going over and slap it right in the bank now and get me one of them checkbooks. Then I'm going to move into a big suite at a hotel. I'm going to hire me a valet and begin living by 2.30. You want to walk over there with me, Amos? Uh, no, Andy, I'm pretty busy right now. The place where I worked is closed down for a few weeks for retooling the factory. They changed the machinery in there, and I was going to try to get my taxi cab fixed. What's the matter with it? Oh, it's just needs a lot of repairs, and I can't afford it. Needs painting and a lot of stuff. I'm gonna try to work it though, so I can get the man at the garage to fix it for me if I can. Yeah, well, see you later then, son. High living Brown is going over and start living. <laughs> well, brother Andrew, there certainly is a good-looking suite you got here at the hotel. But I don't see the reason for the whole thing. Listen, Kingfish, all of my life I done wanted to be a little high class, and now I'm going to be it. I'm going to have breakfast in bed. I'm going to have lunch in bed. Well, even if I was up in the morning, I'm going to get back in bed just to have lunch there. <laughs> uh, well, then, uh, I tell uh, Wait a minute. Uh, excuse me, Kingfish. Hello? Your valet is in the lobby here, Mr. Brown. Oh, well, have him come right up. The valet I done hired is on his way up, Kingfish. Valet? Huh? Yeah. Now, there's another thing, Andy. What do you want with a valet? To wait on me. To press my pants. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. To press your pants. Yeah. All your life, you've been putting them under the mattress just like everybody else. Now you won't be different, huh? Well, I ain't putting my pants under the mattress no more. I is getting tired of them looking like a waffle. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Look, Andy... If you was got to be high class, you can always send your pants down to the tailor shop to be pressed in the basement. Yeah, but who is going to put on my shoes and hold my coat and fill the bathtub for me? Oh, pardon me, your highness. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think of that. Oh, no. Listen, Kingfish, I can't figure out why it is that you and everybody else don't want me to spend my money. And if I was you... Wait a minute. There's my valet. Uh-oh, now the high class stuff starts. Come in. Oh, uh, hello, Jeffries. How do, Miss Brown? I'm uh, glad to see you was on time, Jeffries. Uh, your job and salary starts as of now. Well, then, I'll see you later, then. Just a minute, Mr. Stevens, and I'll be very glad to say goodbye to you. Mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, Jeffries. Uh, yes, sir. 
course, we'll get to the bathtub stuff later, but right now you can take my shoes off. Certainly. Uh, pardon me, sir, but you don't want to have your shoes on. Oh. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, in that case, you can take off my so- uh You can remove my hoses. <laughs> yes, sir. Get a load of this, Kingfish. Yeah, I think I'll be running along, Your Highness. Okay, Kingfish. And if you ever come down to Earth sometime, look me up. Toodle-do, Mr. Stevens. Uh, toodle see you. <laughs> now, Jeffries, uh, I think the first thing to do is kind of figure out your duties here. Well, I'll try to do everything to the best of my ability, sir. Yeah, well, that's what I was paying you for. However, Mr. Brown, if there's anything about my duties that I don't understand, I won't hesitate to ask you. Well, I don't want you to be bothering me with too many questions. If there's anything you don't understand, why, just keep on valeting around here the best you can. Uh, yes, sir. Because, you see, I'm going to be pretty busy around here taking baths and all that kind of stuff. Well, there's one thing, sir, that... Uh, uh, shall I answer it, sir? Yes, you too. Mr. Brown, sweet. I want to speak to Andy. I'll see if Mr. Brown is in. Who's calling, please? Uh, this year is Frederick Montgomery Gwendell. <laughs> Just a moment, please. I'll see if Mr. Brown is in. It's Mr. Gwendell on the phone, Mr. Brown. Okay, I'll take it. And Jeffries. Yes, sir. When you answer the phone, instead of saying Mr. Brown's suite, say Mr. Brown's three-room suite. (laughs) Yes, sir. Oh, hello, Fred. That was my valet. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't hear that you don't go on high class. I'll say, Andy... Remember I told you that after my interview with Ethel Waters, the moving picture star, tomorrow night, I was going to take her out to dinner and the night spots after? Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, well, I tied up, and since I hear that you is now a playboy, and since you done come into that $1,000 bill, how about you taking out instead of me? Oh, that's for me. Hold the phone. Uh, Jeffries. Yes, sir. The master is going out with a movie star. <laughs> Stand by for some high-class stuff. Pardon me, Mr. Brown, uh... Where do you keep your evening clothes? What evening clothes? Oh, I mean, uh, 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 I'll explain that to you later. Yes, sir. I presume you will wear a white tie. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, hello, Fred. Is she going to wear a white tie? <laughs> well, she ain't going to wear a white tie, but it uh, might be a good idea for you to wrap one around your neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'll do that. Uh, count on me. I'll be dressed within an inch of her life. Oh, that's great, Andy. Yeah, I'll have everybody saying, make way for Andrew H. Brown. Okay, I'll call you and give you all the arrangements about where to meet and everything. Okay, Fred. So long. Goodbye. Well, Mr. Brown, I, I suppose you'll want your evening clothes pressed and laid out. Well, uh, I, I tell you about that, Jeffrey. Uh, two days ago, it seems that a pipe done busted in the closet of my country apartment. Yes, sir. The closet got all flooded, and I done got flooded right smack out of my wardrobe. Yes, sir. Those things do happen. They do? I mean, do they? Uh, I mean, uh, 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 anyway, uh, what I want you to do now, Jeffries, uh, you are just about my size. I want you to go out and get me a complete new batch of clothes for high class going out, including a gold-headed cane and a solid gold cigarette case, double thick. High Livin' Andy is all dolled up for his date with Ethel Waters. Right now, the two of them are riding along in a taxi cab. Well, here he is, Miss Waters. So this is the Hot Shot Club. Yeah, this is it. Uh, how much is the fare, driver? The meter reads 85 cents, sir. All right. Here's a dollar, my good man. Keep the change and buy yourself a yacht. I suppose you come here quite often. Oh, sure, I practically lives in the place. I is a big man here. Playboy Brown, they calls me. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, we goes right in here. Oh, good evening, Miss Waters. Oh, good evening. Glad to see you, Captain. My name is Brown. Walk right in, Miss Waters. The check room is on the left. 
Thank you. Check your things over here, please. Oh, Miss Waters, can I take your wrap? No, thanks. I think I'll keep my wrap with me. Okay, Miss Waters. Uh, my name is Brown. Uh, uh, you can... You can take my stuff. Here you is. Uh, there's my gold-headed cane. And, oh, excuse me while I take my solid gold cigarette case out my overcoat pocket. Uh, I got it. This is a charming place. Certainly it's done up elegant. Yeah, I knowed you'd like it. Uh, I got a good table all reserved. I better check on it, too. Oh, how do you do, Miss Waters? Hello there, and how are you? Uh, my name is Brown. <laughs> uh, I got a table reserved here. Straight ahead, please, Miss Waters. The captain will take care. Say, they got some crowd in here. Yeah, they sure is, ain't they? Uh, do you have a re reservation, sir? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I got a reservation under the name of... Uh, oh, how do you do, Miss Waters? I didn't see you with a head turned there. Uh, I got a reservation under the name Just of... Just a minute. Oh, Miss Waters, you won't need a reservation. My name is Brown. All uh, right, this way, please. <laughs> Who that awful mess is with Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, Miss Waters, uh, yeah, there show is a big crowd here. Oh, right here, Miss Waters. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I'll sit over here. Uh, well, you know, Miss Waters, talking about Hollywood like we was, I was thinking about going out there myself. Uh, how is the social life? Well, now, you know what Hollywood is. Uh, what's that? Hollywood. You don't mean to tell me. <laughs> It's just one round of parties. Mm, day and night, huh? Well, I only go to parties at night because in the daytime I'm on the movie set making pictures. Yeah, well, you know, I've been kind of toying with the idea of going into the moving picture business out there myself. The only thing is I ain't been able to make up my mind yet whether I want to finance the pictures or just act in them. Oh, are you an actor? Oh, yeah, sure. I thought that I might act and finance both, but uh, the only trouble is uh, I have such a high salaried actor that I couldn't afford to pay myself. Oh, <laughs> oh yes, I see. Pardon me, Miss Waters. Do you care to order? Yes, I think that would be a grand idea. Yeah, well, while you're taking Miss Waters, I might as well get my order in, too. What do you have tonight that's special, Captain? Well, our steaks are very, very good. Steak? That would just hit the spot with me. Or may I suggest that uh, the thick tenderloin steak for two? Oh, that would suit me fine. Yeah, write that down. Uh, double thick tenderloin steak for two. And what are you going to have? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, bring me the same, I guess. Very good. I'll bring you some nice vegetables, too. Just leave it to me. Why, Ethel, darling, when did you get to New York? Florence, this is a surprise. Sit down. Uh, my name is Brown. Ethel, you're looking <laughs> wonderful. Well, you're pretty stunning yourself in that sequence gown you got on as gorgeous. Who are you here with, Florence? Oh, we just come in. I was with Ed and Fritzy and Dorothy. You know, the whole crowd. Well, Eight of us. well, call them all over here and have dinner with us. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> hey, gang, yeah. look who's here. Come on over. Well, I didn't expect to see you here. When did you come get Come on, here? come on, sit down, all of you. We can all sit at this table. We'll get some extra chairs. <laughs> And I'll order for all of you. How about having what we're having? Double thick tenderloin steaks for two. Oh, that would be perfect. Oh, waiter, make that order. Eight more double thick steaks for two, please. My name is Brown. Have 
Ethel, we all going up to my house. Why don't you come along with us? Well, that sounds good to me. Oh, uh, how about the check for dinner here? Oh, no, no. Wait a minute. You're my guest. I'll join you folks in the, fr- in the front door in just a moment. Say, waiter, bring my escort the check, please. Okay, Miss Wallace. Yeah. I have it right here, sir. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let's see now. That's, uh... Twelve dollars and... No, no, that's one hundred and twenty dollars. Oh, oh, yeah, but I ain't got my glasses. Yeah, I... Oh, you don't mind if we run along, do you? I do want to thank you for a lovely dinner and for inviting all my friends. And I hope to see you again sometime, Mr... Uh, what was the name? Brown. <laughs> So you had a big time last night, huh, Andrew? Yeah, big time. I done went out with a movie star and lots of other people. Oh, big time. Oh, that's great. Glad to hear it, because I know that you wanted to go out and put on the dog and all that stuff. Yeah, well, uh, the only thing is, uh, well, not that it's worrying me or nothing. Uh, well, I know you ain't worried, because no. you're the type of man now that ain't worried about nothing. No, I don't worry about nothing. No, when you loaded, you ain't never worried. I know that. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> wait a minute, though. I think that I have spent a little too much money. Hmm, yeah, well, when you got a checkbook, you kind of lose control, I guess, yeah. Yeah, but I was going to take your advice, Kingfish, and leave the rest of it where it is and let it draw interest. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, uh wait a minute. Hello? Mr. Andrew Brown, please. Speaking. Well, this is the assistant manager over at the Harlem Bank. Mr. Brown, we find that your account is overdrawn $18. Uh, what's that? That's right. And we must ask that you take care of this today. He has a... Uh... Overdrawed $18, huh? Yes, sir. Goodbye, sir. Hmm. Well, uh, Andrew, the whole $1,000 is all gone, huh? Yeah, and $18 besides. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. Uh, if you'd bought war bonds with it, why, you'd have still had it. Plus. Yeah, well, I guess I kind of overwrit myself with them checks there. <laughs> you see, I never had no money before. Never seen it get away so fast. <laughs> Say, Kingfish, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Oh, sure, and i will do anything again to help you. Yeah, would you stop by my hotel and get my gold-headed cane and my gold cigarette lighter, then stop over at Honest Joe's and see if you can get at least $18 on them? <laughs> Oh, come in, Amos, come in. Yeah, I got your phone call, Andy, saying that you wanted to see me here at the office about something reporting. Uh, what's wrong? Uh, nothing wrong. Uh, just want you to come out in the back alley with me for a second. Uh, look, Andy, I was in a big hurry. Uh, I tell you the truth. I got an appointment to see a man about a job. You see, I ain't been doing so good since my taxi cab is laid up, so if you could just tell me now what you want, why... Maybe I could take care of it and then get going a little quicker, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it ain't going to take but a second, Amos. Uh, come on back here in the alley. Well, all right, I'll come back there with you. So tell me, though, Andy. Well, Amos, there it is. Uh, what is... Andy, is that my cab? Yes, sir. All repaired and painted up for you. But Andy... It's all paid for, too, Amos. From me to you, with love. Oh, gee, I hardly recognize it, Andy. It looks so good. Oh, it's just the right color. Oh, they took the dents out of the fenders, too. Oh, look at... Oh, Andy, this is the nicest thing that done ever happened to me. Oh, that's all right. Oh, but the money that must have cost, uh, you ain't had no business spending that much. Oh, Amos, I got a lot of money. I, Well, I, I just talked to my banker on the phone. He called me, too. I didn't call him. <laughs> They like me over there. They, why, they're talking about $18 like it's nothing at all. Yeah. Oh, I, sure, I can afford a thing like this easy. Well, Andy, gee, I can't get over it. It was a wonderful thing for you to do. I was so excited about it that I go in right out today and start working. Okay. Good luck to you, son. And I still say, Willard, that... I wouldn't think so much about losing the money if I could just know what happened to that $1,000 bill. (laughs) 
Well, I guess you'll just have to keep on wondering. Yeah, I guess so. Say, I'm going over to 86 and Park. Can I drop you off? No, no thanks. I go over the west side. Well, Austin, I'll see you during the week. Yeah, yeah, maybe we'll have lunch together. Uh, So long. Oh, taxi, 86 and Park, please. Uh, yes, sir. Ah. (laughs) Nice looking cab you have here. New paint job, isn't it? Uh, yes, sir. It's just been fixed up. Mm. Uh, a friend of mine had it done for me. Oh, well, you're lucky. Yeah, I'll say I was lucky. And a lucky thing happened to this friend of mine, too. Oh, is that so? Yes, sir. You see, this friend, a fellow by the name of Andy, was walking along the street one day, right under the railroad tracks in Harlem. And... <laughs> oh, gee, did you see that car cut right in front of me then? It was a pretty close shave. I don't think you better talk and drive at the same time. Yes, sir. I guess you're right. <laughs> Last year, you remember, infantile paralysis casualties reached terrifying numbers. Playing no favorites, this dreaded scourge struck everywhere. You parents knew the meaning of fear then, for infantile paralysis is an enemy who sends no warning who might invade your home as well as any other. The National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis sponsors the new Kenny treatment, which so often eliminates the crippling after effects of this disease and guarantees this care for every victim who may require it. You can help to carry forward the vital, humane work that is being done by joining the March of Dimes. Why not send your dime or dollar to President Roosevelt at the White House today? Join us again next Friday evening at this same time for the Amos and Andy Show. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas. Our thanks to Miss Ethel Waters for appearing with us tonight. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for all of us and bidding all of you a pleasant good night. You're listening to the Old Time Radio Hour broadcast each week over the World Wide Web with your host, Justine Ward. Amos and Andy was a sensation in early radio. Movie theaters advertised that they stopped the movie from 7 to 7.15 so patrons wouldn't miss Amos and Andy. They had comic cliffhangers with Andy almost getting married and a special broadcast from the 1939 World's Fair. They extended the broadcast from 15 to 24 minutes to tell folks about the fair. After that, we have two short bits, eight minutes of early Amos and Andy after they began to syndicate their recorded shows, and a three-minute sketch from their original show, Sam and Henry. But first, you'll feel the excitement of the Midway in this Amos and Andy, live from the New York World's Fair, first broadcast February 27th, 1939, on NBC Red Network. Campbell's Soups bring you Amos and Andy, with Grover Whalen, president of the 1939 New York World's Fair, in person, in a special half-hour broadcast direct from the fairgrounds. How do you do, everybody? Good news travels fast. Already I hear from grocers and housewives that the new, better-than-ever Campbell's pork and beans are a main topic of table talk. Over the fences and over the phones, one woman tells another, and now families all over the country are being treated to old-fashioned pork and bean suppers with more downright good eating in them than ever before. 
You and your family may have always liked Campbell's pork and beans, but when you serve and taste them now, you'll learn all over again what a delight this old-time dish can be. The moment you open a can of them, you will see that they have a richer, nut-brown color. You will see, too, a generous slice of bacon pork. It's meaty and lean, the kind used in preparing fine breakfast bacon. And when the gleaming, steaming platefuls are served, the whole family will know at once that there is tip-top bean-eating just ahead. They will taste a deeper, fuller flavor that puts new pleasure in every forkful. And I'm sure they will agree with me that these are the best pork and beans ever. Don't wait any longer to enjoy these better-than-ever Campbell's pork and beans. Plan to have them as a welcome treat tomorrow. Immediately following tonight's broadcast, Amos and Andy would like to say a few words to their friends. In preparing for the Harlem World's Fair, Andy decided to write a personal letter to Grover Whelan, the president of the New York World's Fair, requesting that the two get together. Much to Andy's surprise, he received a very courteous reply from Mr. Whelan, inviting him to visit the New York World's Fair. As the scheduled hour of the meeting approaches, Andy's becoming very nervous and found it necessary to purchase a small bottle of smelling salts, which he is carrying in his pocket. As the scene opens now, we find Amos and Andy in the fresh air taxicab arriving at one of the nine entrances of the New York World's Fair. Both boys are dressed in their Sunday best for the occasion. Here they are. Well, here's the gate right up here, Nine. And there's a policeman standing there. He looked like the Northwest Mounted, don't he? Yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe we better not go in there. I can see Mr. Whale some other time. Well, wait a minute, now. You can't turn around now. Here we is almost there. Oh, me. Let me get out my smelling salts and take one more whiff. Listen, I'm going to stop and ask this policeman. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. My mouth's so dry, I can't say nothing. You do the talking. Yeah. And what can I do for you? Uh, mister, we've got an appointment to see Mr. Grover Whelan. And here's a letter that Mr. Whelan writ. Uh, give me the letter, Andy. Uh, yeah, wait. Um, here it is. Uh, yeah, I say, uh, here it is, mister. It's a letter to Andrew H. Brown. And this is Andy right here. And my name is Amos Jones. Oh, yes, yes. Mr. Whelan is expecting you, I think. And at the present time, you'll find him on the bridge that joins the Perisphere and the Trilon. Uh, well, well, where is the Perilon and the, the tri thing at? Well, that's the large ball in the tall tower. Drive right in. Uh, uh, yeah, sir, yeah. Thank you very much, mister. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I got you in, son. I told you that I'd get you in all right. Now, the next thing we got to do is go over here. Look at there, Andy. Look at that ball there. That's the biggest ball I ever see. Yeah, boy, that's a whopper. And look at that monument going up in the air. Look at that. Yeah. You know, I read in the paper that that thing going up is taller than the Washington Monument. Yeah. Look at the buildings, will you? Boy, this is something. Look here. The streets is paved. Trees is growing in here. Look at that. Yeah, look at the colors. All the streets is different colors here. One go up that way is yellow. That one starts out and... Look at that. It starts out pink and it gets red up at the end. Yeah, that's right. Look at that. There's a blue street. Oh, cool. This is the prettiest thing I ever seen in my life, Andy. Yeah, I didn't know it was this big. They really got a fair here, ain't they? They sure is. Look at that building there. What does say there? Go ahead, go ahead. Don't look around there. Keep look. Watch where you're going. I'm driving over there. Say there, Hall of P-H-A-R... Pharmacy. Mm. They ought to be able to fill a subscription in there. Look at that ball, Andy. That must be 20 or 30 stories high. Sitting in a pool of water, too. Look at there. Yeah. Well, get over there so we can get up on that bridge that joins the ping pong and the atmosphere together. Yeah. I better stop the cab right here, Andy. Yeah, pull up there and let's ask that policeman. Yeah, look up now. I'll leave it here. Well, let's get out and... I'll take a whiff of this smelling salts, too. <laughs> I get nervouser and nervouser. Uh, excuse me, mister, but uh, we got an appointment with Mr. Whelan and somebody say up on that bridge up there. How we get up there, please? Step right inside and the escalator will take you up. Uh, ask a who? Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, just step on the inside. Thank you, mister. Come on, Andy. Uh, look here. Look. 
There's the steps that carry you up without you walking. Look at the steps going up in the air. Yeah, let me get on. Look at there. We're going up in the air, will you? Look at... Hold on, Amos. Hold on. Where's my smelling salt? Take it easy. Let me go. It ain't going to hurt you. Look here. We're going up in the top of that ball on these steps, Andy. Oh, me. Why did I ever start this thing? Wait a minute. <laughs> this smelling salt is getting weak as a kitten. Done lost all its flavor. I ought to brung some acrobatic spirits ammonia with me. Boy, these steps really take you up in there, don't they? Yeah, now I gotta meet Mr. Whale and argue with him. Yeah. I don't see why I started that Harlem Fair in the first place. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Here, we're getting to the top now. Here, at the top of the steps now. Get ready to get off this thing. Yeah. Look out the way now. Well, I've been doggone. Look how easy it is to get off the thing. You can't hurt yourself. No, that was easy. Oh, boy, look. We is in the middle of the ball. Look at that. Mm-mm. That's the biggest thing I ever seen in my life. Look down there, Andy. Look, there's building in the bottom of this thing. There sure is. Oh, this is what they're going to call the city of tomorrow. That, that's what this is. Oh, yeah. Look at the size of the thing. Yeah, this ball must be 25 or 30 stories high. Yeah, it's a big one. Ask the man how we see Mr. Wellborn, and I'll take it with it to smell and sauce. Uh, excuse me, mister, but you say that, uh, uh, mister, mister, mister Whalen, somebody told us, was up here on the bridge. Uh, how you get out there? Uh, you go right through that door there, and you'll find Mr. Whalen right out there alone. Uh, yeah, sir, thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, come on in. Uh, I wish I had some headache pills. Stop worrying now, come well, on. Well, I wish I didn't make this date. Yeah. Oh, there he is, Andy. There he is out there on the bridge. Look at him. Oh, boy. Well, he is up in the air here, ain't we? Yeah, there he is now, Andy. There's Mr. Whelan there looking over the fair. See him standing there by himself? Must we go home? No, you've been talking about meeting him, and he asked you over here, so you might as well walk up to him. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. Don't, don't, don't rush me. Let's, let's, let's look around a second before we go over there. Maybe I'll feel better. You were shaking like a leaf. Look at that, Andy. Look at all those buildings. You know, I didn't dream it was going to be like this. Look at the color. Yeah, I wish he'd give me this one for the Harlem Fair and start another one for himself. I can't believe what I'm looking at, you know what? Here we are, Andy, standing on top of the bridge that joins the ball and the tower, looking all over the New York World's Fair. And what a sight. Mm -mm. Yeah, boy, it's something all right. Look over there. Yeah, I know it was going to be big, but I didn't know it was going to be gyrantic. Mm. Well, let's get over there with Mr. Wheeler now. Come on. Oh, me. Well, here goes nothing. Well, come on now. You speak to him. I was nervous. I having a nervous breakdown. Uh, excuse me. Is, is this Mr. Grover Whelan? Yes, my name is Whelan. Uh, my name is Amos Jones, and this is uh, Andy Brown, the fella that wrote you the letter. Oh, yes. How do you do? Yes, sir. Nice to know you both. Yes, sir. I'm glad to have you here. Uh, yes, sir. You see, Mr. Whale, uh, I is putting on the Harlem Fair. It'll be a little bigger than this, uh, but uh, before I start building, I thought I'd like to, to talk to you. Oh, yes. You uh, you wrote to me about the Harlem Fair. Yes, yes sir. Well, I, I, I'll be very happy to cooperate with you. Give me any assistance, give you, rather, any assistance that I can. Yes, sir. What do you think of the New York World's Fair up to now? Uh, he talking to you, Andy. Yeah, well, uh, it looked like the headquarters for Flash Gordon. Well, the buildings are modern. We've tried to carry out the same idea throughout the fair. Yeah, yeah Mr. Whelan, I wonder if you'd be uh, kind enough to kind of explain a few things to us about the fair... And I think Andy would like to know what the things cost. Yeah, that's right. I, I got my finance committee working on some money with uh, some weak-minded bankers. Well, now, let me see. From where we're standing, we have a pretty good view of the entire fair. Yes, yeah, sir. As we look straight ahead here, we look down this beautiful avenue, which we have named the Constitution Mall. A mall. Sound like a gangster's gal. The Constitution Mall is the central uh, esplanade leading from the theme center to the Lagoon of Nations. Yeah, sir. Now you boys have asked me the cost of these things. Yeah, sir. 
I'll try to give them to you as I go along, as long as you are interested in the building of a fair. Yes, sir, that's right. The cascades and the pools and the fountains, the 65-foot statue of George Washington with landscaping and murals, including the buildings that line the Constitution Mall, together with underground utilities, represent an expenditure of $60 million. Oh, uh, excuse me. I just want to take a whiff of this stuff here. Uh, yeah. that, uh, that statue of George Washington, I certainly is a big one already. Is that the only statue in the fairground? Yes, that is the only statue of an individual. The reason for that is because on our opening date, April 30th, we are celebrating in America the 150th anniversary of George Washington's, our first president of the United States, who was inaugurated in the city of New York under the federal constitution. Yes, sir, that sure is nice. Sir. Now, way down there, I see a pool there that looks like a cement pool or something with fountains all over it. Yeah, that's a big pool you got down there, too, uh... What's the size of that thing there where that water is shooting all up in the air? Yeah, so tell us about that big pool down there, Miss Wheeler. If you boys have time later on, I will take you down there so that you can appreciate the size of the lagoon of nations, or as you call it, that pool of water. Yes, sir. Well, uh, how big is the thing? The fountains themselves throw the water 250 feet in the air. Mm-hmm. At certain intervals, a flame of fire and in various colors is projected 150 feet in the air. When the thousand fountains in the lagoon are turned off at night, 20 tons of water fall at one time. Hmm. The lagoon itself is enormous. It is so large, boys, that you could actually put all of Radio City in this one lagoon. Yeah, but that's big already. Yeah, well, I built one that big for a mustard bath for the feet of the people. And then I got one there. You could put Radio City in sideways, and the water looks like the Empire State Building. At the extreme end of the Constitution Mall, this beautiful building you see is the federal government building. Oh, yeah, sir. That sure is a pretty building, all right. Yeah. Our own United States government building is flanked on both sides by the buildings of 60 foreign nations, the League of Nations and the Pan-American Union. These governments represent 90% of the entire population of the world. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Whale. I'm going to have to take a whiff of this stuff. Yeah, tell me this. Uh, uh, which of these uh, nation, uh, which of these nation buildings? That building on the left of the lagoon you will notice, is flying the French flag. Oh, yeah. Just beyond that, and on the other corner of the lagoon, stands the... stands Great Britain and her dominion. Yeah, yeah, yes. Italy has that large cascading tower with the waterfalls. Yeah. On the right, you can plainly see the Belgium Tower. Mm -hmm. And the building with the tall statue of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Then there is Czechoslovakia, and to the right of that is the building erected here by Japan. Yeah. And, of course, you can see the various flags flying on the other building. Yeah. Representing 60 nations of the world and expenditure by them of $30 million of their own money. Excuse me, I'll just take a short whiff. <laughs> Tell me this, uh, uh, what is that over there on the right, all those buildings over that way there? What is them? Uh, that is the Court of States. They represent... The states of the Union. Yeah, sure is a mess of them there, ain't it? Sure is. Let's turn around and look over this side once, boys. Yeah. yeah, sir. I might tell you something that would be of value to you at your Harlem Fair. Uh, yeah, sir. Hmm. I don't know whether you'd be selected the site yet or not. Oh, yes, yeah, sir. Well, we, uh... I go tear down everything I can get my hands on and start from there. Uh, tell me this, uh, How big is this fair, Miss Williams? The fair is three and a half miles long, and in the center it is a mile and a half wide. Oh. <laughs> this stuff that I'm sniffing is getting weaker and weaker. Uh, tell me this, uh, uh, how about uh, as we go along here when the fair is running, how about getting the people in here and getting them out of here? That's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah. How might I tell you that we have nine entrances to the New York World's Fair. We have parking space for 42,000 automobiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
subway and trains bring you direct to the fair. For five cents, you may catch the rapid transit line from any part of New York City and come directly to the gates of the fair. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, boys, we have facilities to take care of 160,000 people an hour. Exclusive of the automobile traffic. Oh, me. <sighs> My committee will faint when I get back with them. Yeah. I'll take them some smelling salts, too. Uh, tell me this, Mr. Whelan. Uh, what you going to charge to get in here? Admission to the fair is 75 cents. Children under 14 years of age, 25 cents. And on special days, 10 cents for children. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know what I'm going to soak to people, uh, Amos, make a memorandum. Well, is you got a pencil? Uh, uh, yeah, here. Yeah. Here's a red one. A red one? Yeah, you see, uh, Mr. Will, the Harlem Fair started off in the red, and we ain't swum out in the black yet. Yeah, well, what you want me to write down, Andy? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Will. He must remind me to call Puddin' Face at 8 o'clock. Oh, and well, wait a minute. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Will. Uh, that big body of water down there on the right, Mr. Will, uh... That don't happen to be one of the great lakes, do it? No, that happens to be a large artificial lake which is surrounded by one of the most interesting amusement areas we could possibly develop. Oh, you going to have anything down there like the shoot the shoot? Well, the entire fair represents the world of tomorrow. The amusement area, for instance, will have a bobsled ride which travels at a speed of 80 miles an hour. That entire area you see surrounding the lake represents every modern form of amusement we could think of. Uh, Amos, uh, remind me to tell that man that's got that merrig around that I want something bigger. Let's look over this, in this direction. Yes. Yeah. This section here uh, to the south is known as the transportation area. Yeah. There you see aviation, shipping. Railroads and motor cars representing all forms of transportation. Yeah. I can assure you boys that a visitor can spend many interesting hours in any one of these buildings, which of course are all free to the public. Yeah, tell me this, what is that tower up there? That is a part of the RCA exhibit, and the tower you see standing is the television broadcasting. Yeah, well tell me this, uh, is you going to have any pop crackers at night like uh, fireworks? In the Lagoon of Nations, each evening, there will be an elaborate display of fireworks, which is later followed by another display of fireworks in the lake adjoining the amusement section. Yeah, well, i got to take another whiff of this stuff. Yeah, now, what is all these buildings, these hundreds of buildings all over here? These buildings represent American industry, including practically every large industry in the world. Yeah, so, well, Mr. Whelan, we don't want to take up too much of your time. It sure was nice of you to explain this. Yeah, I think I'll go back to Harlem and get my committee together and take out all the plans I got and tear them up. I will say this, that without the splendid cooperation I have received from my entire staff and the Executive and Finance Committee of the World's Fair, the thing you see now would have been impossible. And for that cooperation, believe me, boys, I am very grateful. Uh, tell me this, Miss Whelan, how much money did the whole New York Fair cost? $155 million. Uh, uh, I beg you to apologize. Uh, what's that last remark? $155 million. You don't want to take a whiff of this stuff, do you, Mr. Whelan? <laughs> It was very nice uh, to have you over. Yeah, then we want to thank you, too, for letting us come over here, Miss Whelan. Yes, sir, and uh, when I get my fare built, why, I'll explain it to you. Thanks for coming, and good luck to you with the Harlem World's Fair. Well, thank you, Mr. Whelan, and goodbye. Yeah, goodbye, Mr. Wilby. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Amos and Andy would like to say a few words to their listeners. Uh, ladies and gentlemen... Tonight's broadcast, direct from the World's Fairgrounds in New York City, was done to give you a brief idea of the fair itself. First, let us explain and express our deep appreciation to Mr. Grover Whalen for his kindness in appearing on tonight's program. My partner, Andy, and myself have spent many days going through the New York World's Fair. 
And in fairness to ourselves and to the New York World's Fair, we must tell you that it was impossible to give you a description of the magnitude of this great international exposition in the time allotted us tonight. Sometimes as we sort of go along, why, you size up a situation by one remark that a person may make. We felt something, and as we pass it on to you, why, you may feel it too. In asking the officials many questions about the New York World's Fair, they told us that the fair itself cost $155 million, but a child may get a glass of milk for five cents. Something like that kind of shows you that they ain't overlooked nothing. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, folks. In a moment, we bring you Edwin C. Hill, celebrated news commentator in the human side of the news, cut somewhat short tonight by our special World's Fair broadcast. You know, for years, Campbell's pork and beans have been the best-liked pork and beans in the country. So, naturally, it wasn't easy to improve them. And Campbell's chefs succeeded in doing so only after months of patient experimenting. Today, these pork and beans, made by the makers of those fine Campbell soups, are new and better than ever before. The beans are the best money can buy slowly and skillfully cooked to mellow perfection. The tomato sauce is racy and tempting. But now the beans have a deeper, nut-brown color and a richer, fuller flavor. In each can, you'll find a generous slice of lean bacon pork. And after you've eaten a portion, I promise you satisfaction that's keener than you've ever known before. When you buy pork and beans, remember this. You can't buy beans at any price that are any better than Campbell's. Yet Campbell's cost you very little more than ordinary kind. And I believe if you try Campbell's just once, you'll make it a rule always to say, Campbell's pork and beans. This is Amos and Andy, Efficiency Expert. First broadcast January 15, 1929, on WMAQ Chicago. You see, Mr. Uh, Mr. My name is Audie Fox. Just call me Mr. Fox. Uh, Mr. Fox, uh, you see, before we get up to where Andy is, I thought I'd explain to you some of the things so you'd know, you see. Of course you understand, Mr. Jones, that as an efficiency expert, I must have all the details. But as time goes on, I will no doubt familiarize myself with the conditions surrounding your business. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you see, uh, the first thing, we come up here from Atlanta, Georgia and uh, started in this here taxi cab business. Oh, yes. And do you find it a profitable business? Yeah, I find... Uh, oh, you mean, uh, you mean is it making any money? That's it. Are you making any profit at the present time? Well, we are taking in some money, but we ain't got nothing to show for it. Well, Mr. Jones, that's just where I come in. You see, my business as an efficiency expert enables me to make the necessary corrections in your business and put you on a money-making basis. Well, first, I better tell you, though, that Andy is the president of the company, and sometimes he gets mad if you cross him up, you see, so you kind of got to look out for Andy. Mr. Jones, I have found that in my wide experience as efficiency expert, sometimes we must disregard the feeling of some of the firm and go ahead with determination to make the corrections and prove to the officers of the company that they are deriving a great benefit from the various new systems that I install. In the stall, you see? Yes, in the stall. What stall? You know, we ain't got no horses if you had taxi cab coming. You misconstrued my last remark. You don't mean to tell me. I will be glad to go over the situation with the president of your company, and I want you to know, Mr. Jones, that it is through sheer luck that I am able to accept this assignment. Mm -hmm. It so happened that I came to Chicago from Pittsburgh to take on the work of correcting a big manufacturing plant. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, before I could reach the scene of action, it became necessary for this firm to file bankruptcy proceedings. Well, now, uh, Mr. Fox, uh, here we is at the taxi cab headquarters. Oh, yes. Uh, you can look right through the window there. There's Andy asleep. Seeing there with his feet on the desk asleep. Well, where is the president of the company? That's him. Oh, yes. The president is asleep. Mm hmm. Well, let us enter, and after I have a talk with your president, we can get together on a salary arrangement a little later. Well, walk right in, Miss Fox. You can't wake him up unless you shake him. 
When he sleeps, he don't mess with it. What time does he want to be called? I'll shake him now. Andy. Andy, wake up. Wake up. Hello? You ain't answering the telephone. This here is me. What are you doing coming in here and waking me up like this? Andy, this here is Mr. Fox. Uh, this here is Andy Brown, the president of the company. Mr. Brown, it is indeed a pleasure. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was glad to see you. You want a taxi cab? Well, Mr. Brown, that shows that you are alert to the fact of serving the public as quickly as possible. But it so happens that I am the efficiency expert that Mr. Jones talked to you about. You is the efficient what? No, no, Andy, listen. This year is the gentleman that I talked to you about, remember? Oh. Wake up now, Andy. You are still asleep. Look oh, at you now. Open your eyes. This year is the gentleman that takes the business and puts it on the business basis. You see, don't you remember me telling you about him down the large hall where I met him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I beg to apologize. Sit down, sit down. Amos, where is that other chair that we have? He never had no other chair. It's all right, gentlemen. It's all right. I'll sit here on the desk. Mm-hmm. Mr. Brown, your business associate here, informs me that you are in need of an efficiency expert. I am the efficiency expert that you need. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Fox. Uh, here, 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 here's a box here. Sit right down on this box over here. Oh, yeah. You as a gentleman, huh? Now, uh, go right ahead, Mr. Fox, and ask and anything you want to ask him. If he don't know it, I'll try to tell you the best I can. If who don't know it? There ain't nothing around here that I don't know. Now, get that in your head. Well, gentlemen, let there be no dissension. Let there be no word, Miss Fox. Shut up, shut up. Now, Mr. Brown, you are in the taxi cab industry. You are catering to the public. Am I correct? Amos ain't told you nothing like that, is he? No, the only thing I told him was... Shut up, shut up, Amos. Well, now, gentlemen, I just want to ask you a few questions. You are in the taxi cab business, serving the public in that capacity. Oh, yes, sir. We done that. I don't remember when it was, but we done it. Now, if I come into this business, I will no doubt be able to install a few systems which will enable you to conserve your energy, eliminate unnecessary expenditures, and get what you might call a dormant business on the basis of a going business. A going business? It's almost gone now. Shut up, shut up, Mr. I ain't going to do it. Go ahead, Mr. Wolf. I mean, uh, Mr. Fox. Mr. Brown, I can see at a glance that you could use an efficiency man. And I would be glad to look over the situation here now and give you my frank opinion as to whether or not it would be an unnecessary expenditure to bring me into the company. Oh, I agree with you there, all right. Uh, Mr. Fox, uh... Uh, you want to look at the book? Wait a minute, round here. Wait a minute. Don't holler about the book. I was keeping the book. Oh, I know you keep them. I just ask him if he won't look at them. That's all I see. Well, if the president has no objection, I would like to glance at the journal and the ledger. You want to glance at what? I say I would like to look at your book if you have no objection and see what system you are using. I think uh, Mr. Fox ought to come in and, and see what he could do with the company. He might be able to twist it around so that we'd make some money out of the thing. Well, uh, Mr. Fox, in case you start to work, uh, what do you do? Yeah, seeing that to Andy, Mr. Fox. Well, I analyze your business, get right to the bottom of each detail. You see there? There's something right there if you, if you, if you do that. Let him see the books, Andy. Well, here's the book. <laughs> I just sort of keep these in the rough, you see. I got a better one, better set than this at home, under the bed. Oh, yeah. This is your book, huh? The Fresh Air Taxi Cab Company, Incorporated, of America. Andrew Brown, President. Nice title page you have. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You see, I worked on the books day and night myself. Amos is the assistant bookkeeper, but uh, I don't let him mess with nothing. Mr. Brown, what are these figures you have in the front of the book here? What figures is that, you mean? These figures right here. Four million, six million, seven million. Here's one figure here. Nine billion, nine hundred million. What are these figures? How did they get in that book? 
There's your own hand, lady. You put them in there yourself. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I remember now. One day I got hold of a new pencil, and I was trying it out on that tape. 